Hey there! Welcome to Fiber 101. I am Becca from the Knitting Unicorn Podcast, and this is a series that I'm putting together all about different types of fiber for knitters, not for spinners. Um, I've realized in recent weeks, months, um, when talking to other knitters that a lot of people don't really understand the difference between fibers. I mean, a lot of us know the difference between wool and acrylic, but other than that, you know, some merinos or cashmeres might pill a little, and we know some things like that. But I find a lot of knitters think that um, when they're picking out yarns for different projects that as long as they have the same weight yarn, they can just substitute it. And they don't consider the fiber. I know that when I was a new knitter years ago, I um, I went to knit a, it's kind of like a poncho type of thing, and it called for a bulky weight wool, I believe. But I knit it in alpaca, and the whole thing just fuzzed right up, which was not appropriate for the garment. Um, so since then, I have really um, had a passion for learning more about different kinds of fibers. And I mentioned that in a previous podcast, and some people were interested in learning more. So I have put together this series, uh, and each episode will be a different kind of fiber. Um, and this week, we are talking about protein fibers, and specifically wool, which comes from sheep. So, welcome, and I'm so happy you're here. Um, so, before I delve into all of the different qualities of wool, I wanted to briefly talk about the four different varieties of fiber. There are protein, which is basically fiber, hair, fur, whatever, that comes from an animal. Um, that can be sheep, alpaca, camel, yak, um, even silk. It can even be humans and pets. All of this hair is a protein. Um, and we will talk about that today and what makes, not all about what makes protein fiber, but some of the specific characteristics that you don't see in other kinds of fibers. The next kind of fiber that is available is um, cellulose fibers, and those are derived from the cellulose that naturally occurs in plants, and those kinds of fibers would be cotton, linen, or hemp. Then there's cellulosic fibers. Those are also made from the cellulose of plants, but they've been chemically treated um, to form a liquid which is then spun from a machine. Uh, those would be things like rayon and tensile. And then the last variety is purely synthetic fibers, and those are made, uh, man-made from completely artificial uh, materials, and those would be your nylon, your polyester, and your acrylics. Um, and yes, there are blends of all these different kinds together, and they create all kinds of beautiful fabrics. And, you know, we'll talk more about that uh, when we talk about blends. Today I'm going to talk specifically about wool from sheep. And that's, at least in the U.S., that's an important distinction because the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is, um, allows commercial yarn companies to, um, They're allowed to label their different fibers um, as wool, even if they are not. Um, so, for example, if it's cashmere or angora goat, camel, alpaca, llamas, even uh, acuna, any combination of those or those on their own, they're allowed to be labeled wool. Um, it's not often that they leave those off the label because those tend to be more expensive fibers and so it you know, makes them more marketable and more 
expensive if they say this is a cashmere wool blend or whatever, um, but they do have the option to just call it wool, even if it's not primarily sheep. Um, so that's just an important distinction uh, to be aware of. And so today we're only talking about sheep. However, um, we can't talk about wool or any protein fiber without talking about scales. Scales are a part of the fiber that make it a protein fiber. And all protein fibers have scales. Even our hair has scales. Um, I'm going to show this image from the Clara Parks Knitter's Book of Yarn. And this is an image you've probably seen on like a hair conditioner commercial. And it's this image right here. And that's what our hair looks like. That's what wool looks like under a microscope to some degree. I mean, they're going to be a little different depending on the type of animal, the breed of the animal, um, and then even variations between specific animals and specific farms. But the fibers have little scales coming off of them, almost like fish. And those scales are predominantly what make protein fibers look the way they look, feel the way they feel, and behave the way they behave. Um, other things that factor into that are things like length and crimp and all of that, but I'm not going to delve into that. Um, there's a lot of resources for really in-depth information, um, and that's also really important for like spinners, but I'm going to keep this a little bit higher level and really just about yarn for knitters. Um, so protein fibers have scales, and they act like Velcro. Um, you'll notice that if your hair gets tangled, it starts to stick together. Well, it's not necessarily because it's in knots, it's because the scales are grabbing onto each other. I should probably put my drink down. They're grabbing onto each other like this, and it's like Velcro. It's the same thing with wool and other protein fibers. Um, so the scales help hold the fiber together, and that creates a strong and durable yarn. Um, they're also the reason why protein fibers can felt. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about felting, but um, just so you're aware, that's what causes the felting, is that the scales that come together and they grip on so tight and then they, they felt up. Uh, finer fibers, like a super wash, not a super wash, a super fine merino would have, or even regular merino, they have more scales, but they're smaller. Whereas a long-haired wool, is going to have larger scales and fewer of them. So your super fine merino could have up to 3,000 scales per inch, or two and a half centimeters, where your long hair wool could have as few as 600 scales per inch. Um, that's a big difference. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, like uh, cashmere and mohair, uh, and I'll talk about those when I talk about goats and, and other types of fibers. But typically, that's the way that you think of it. The finer the wool, the smaller and more numerous the scales, and vice versa for the long ones. Um, so, what does that mean? Well, you probably know that a merino wool, especially a super fine merino wool, is going to be really soft and almost scratch free. People who tend to have sensitivities to wool can usually handle a merino or a superwash merino, and we'll talk about superwash later on, um, because the scales are so little. The scales are what can cause that itch or that irritation for people with more sensitive skins. Um, and another function of the scales, and this is really important, this is what makes wool and protein fibers what they are, is that scales trap air. So when they're um, even especially when they're knit together, when they're spun, they trap little pockets of air and they create insulation, which makes them warmer. And, you know, even, you know, if we're talking about a woolen spun, and I'm going to show you a couple uh, different yarns in a moment, um, woolen spun fibers, they're all jumbled up. 
so they trap all kinds of air. So even a really thin yarn um, can be incredibly warm compared to something that's denser, uh, like a woolen spun uh, in a worsted weight. I'm sorry, a worsted spun, and I know it's confusing because there's worsted spun and there's worsted weight. But let's say you have a worsted spun, worsted weight mitten, and then you have a sport weight woolen spun mitten. The woolen spun is going to be warmer even though it's not as dense because it insulates better. And I will show you the difference between a woolen and a worsted spun. So oh, here's a couple of balls of yarn that I have. Um, these are from Romney Ridge, which is um, a farm and a shop in Ipswich, Mass. I love their yarns. Um, and this is the Romney Ridge Farm Blend, and this is the Romney Ridge Nimbus. And if you look at them very close up, they look a little bit different. They're about the same weight, but this one is worsted spun, and this one is woolen spun. So if you look at this, it's very light and squishy, and you can't feel the heaviness, but this is much denser. This one is going to be significantly warmer because it's all jumbled together in there, creating little insulation pockets of air. And um, they're both very warm, they, they both have scales, but the woolen spun will definitely be warmer, and you can see that it just looks a little fluffier than the worsted spun. Even though they have predominantly the same types of wool in them. These are wool blends. Um, Romney Ridge blends their, I believe they have their own Romneys, but they also get other wool from local farms and mix it together. Like a lot of wool, basic wool is, unless it's specifically Merino um, or Blueface Lester. It's going to usually be a blend. Wool is hygroscopic. And that means that the fiber is able to absorb up to 30% of its own weight in water or moisture uh, while still feeling warm and dry against the skin. So this makes it a great product for uh, outdoor activities. I have a pair of socks for running when it's not very nice weather like today. Um, and they're woolen running socks that if I get in into a puddle or it's raining and my shoes are getting wet, my feet still feel warm and dry. Um, you know, hats and mittens and jackets, that's why wool is used for those kinds of applications because it stays warm while wet. Uh, you know, unlike a cotton where if it gets wet you get soaked and cold. The other thing that's great about wool and what the scales do is because it traps water and air, wool is almost completely flame retardant. If it catches fire, it will self-extinguish itself, uh, which is why firefighters will use wool for fire blankets and things like that. And the last thing is that wool is, um, it doesn't conduct static electricity uh, the way other fabrics do. So, um, you know, when you are walking around and you get a shock from the static electricity, you don't really get that from wool. You know, so maybe try wearing wool socks around your house. Um, not super wash, but again, we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, one of the other things that is important about it being uh, not conducting static electricity is that static in your fibers can attract dirt, fine particles of dirt and, uh, and dust and trap it inside. Because wool doesn't conduct static electricity, it's not trapping dirt in, so it's a much cleaner fabric. Um, and uh, in this book that I have, which I love, and if you're interested in this topic, I highly recommend it, is Clara Park's The Knitter's Book of Yarn. And she says that despite over a century of effort, not a single man-made fiber yet possesses all of these amazing qualities. 
So you're just, you're not gonna get a fiber that does all these things um, that's synthetic or man-made in any way. So that's pretty cool. And, um, you know, those, some of those qualities are specific to wool, but also specific to protein fibers. So how do we get wool? Well, uh, sheep are shorn uh, once or twice a year, depending on the sheep and the farm and how they process their wool. And it's almost always done in the spring and or the fall. And the mass of fiber that's shorn off the sheep is called a fleece. And this fleece, it's usually a big, dense chunks of sheep wool. <laughs> and it's called a fleece. And it's it contains everything that was on the sheep at the time of shearing. And oftentimes that means dirt, it means vegetable matter, and it means lanolin. And lanolin is a, um, a greasy substance that is secreted from the lamb's sebaceous glands, so in their skin. Just like we have sebaceous glands and we excrete oil, which keeps our skin um, moist and does other things for us, um, sheep also have sebaceous glands and they secrete lanolin. Lanolin does a couple things. It kind of waterproofs the um, the sheep's wool and it also helps protect their skin from infection. And lanolin has been used for years as a moisturizing product and, and used in a lot of different types of products for that. Um, And different kinds of sheep will produce different amounts of lanolin and also that the way that they're processed the yarn will have different amounts of lanolin in it as well. Some sheep are coated uh, which means they're actually put little coats on them to protect them and they probably have less lanolin than some others and then also after it's been shorn and it's been processed depending on how it's processed and how it's washed it may retain or not retain some of the lanolin in it. So let's talk a little bit about sensitivities. Um, there has been a debate going on forever um, between knitters and dermatologists and doctors, whatever, about wool allergy. Um, I'm sure there are people who are allergic to wool. I mean, there's people who are allergic to everything. Um, I am not allergic to wool, but I'm definitely sensitive to it. And a lot of people are sensitive to wool. And like I said, that could be the scales, so a finer scale um, fiber may be better for you, like a merino. Um, also, there are some people that believe the lanolin content, people might be sensitive to lanolin, so you might want to check your content on that. And also, because I said before, the FDA isn't required to tell you exactly what kind of animal fibers are in the wool, for the most part. Um, there could be something else in your yarn that is causing sensitivities. Um, so if you are feeling itchy, there are things that you can do. Um, you can try, you know, first of all, check the content of your yarn. You can try and knit more with super fine merinos or super wash merinos. Um, and you can also check out some blends, uh, some wool acrylic blends might be better for you. I know that I just knit a baby sweater in the Barocco Vintage, which is a merino acrylic blend, and it's crazy soft without any itch. It's perfect for babies. Um, so things like that can really help. And Superwash Merino is a type of wool that um, is also not itchy. So if you're really crazy sensitive, I know a couple people who are, they are even sensitive to superwash wool uh, merino, but that's rare. Most people can have superwash merino against their skin, which is you know, one reason it's used so often in socks. Um, and so, you know, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about superwash wool. And um, Anna from the Dunkelgrun podcast has a really good segment in one of her podcasts about superwash wool and, and the specifics of it. And I will link to that somewhere up here so you can check that out because uh, that's a great 
uh, episode. She's a chemist and she knows a lot about this stuff. But um, basically, the traditional method to make superwash roll is called the Hercocet method. And it's a chemical process that strips the yarn of its scales. And basically it turns it into a fiber that's not really wool anymore because it doesn't um, absorb water, it's not hygroscopic anymore. It doesn't insulate with air pockets anymore, so it's not really very warm. Um, you know, it, might be, was, it might as well be comparable to um, cotton. And it's a little warmer, and it, you know, it's, it's not the same as cotton. But I mean, it's not really wool anymore because the scales are what make wool wool. Um, and the other thing about superwash is that the Hercocet method is really bad for the environment. Now the good news is that there are lots of new techniques that have come out and have been coming out uh, that are much more eco-friendly. I was recently watching, oh my gosh, I don't even know what it was, but I was watching a podcast where they were talking about how the army uniforms have to be made out of superwash merino for some reason, I forget why. And because of that, it has to have government standards where it has to be organic and it can't um, hurt the environment and things like that. So a, a lot of those wools are using other methods. Um, and there are different things that you can look for. There's um, looking for GOTS or G-O-T-T-S certified, um, Blue Sign certified, Blue Sign is a chemical certification. Uh, not, it's not specific to wool, but um, things that are Blue Sign certified are eco-friendly. And then there are some wools like um, Tannis Fiber Arts. I know is one that uses an organic got certified wool. And Swan Island uses. Um, they have a a method called Eco Wash, and I don't know the specifics of how it's done, but it's an eco-friendly way to create a super wash bowl. So if you, if that's something you really care about, those are things to look out for. But super wash wool has its uses. I am not ditch dissing on super wash wool at all. It's, it's a great thing. Um, like I said, it is something that's really good for people with sensitivities to have against their skin. Um, and it also makes a great sock because it doesn't felt. And what super wash does, the, the whole reason for Superwash is it makes your wool machine washable. Now, I still don't put any of my Superwash items in the dryer. I just, I just don't. Um, they have gotten in the dryer and they've been okay, but I try not to because I really want them to last as long as possible. Um, but I, I throw them in the wash with all my regular clothes and I just wash them uh, and then I lay them flat to dry or if they're socks, I might put them on blockers and be done with it, which is great. Um, and for a sock, which is something you wear a lot, um, you want it to be easily washable. Not everyone wants to hand wash knits all the time. It's also really good for gift knitting because you don't know what you're gonna get, uh, who you're gonna give it to, how they're gonna treat your knitting. I mean, hopefully they're knit worthy people and they take good care of the things you knit them. But, you know, if they're not knitters and they don't, you know, they're not going to hand wash everything. So Superwash is great for that too. Um, also, I don't know how accurate this is, but it is my understanding that, I don't know if it's all Superwash wool, if it's one particular method or, or what, but I've been told that Superwash wool often has um, a coating on it to help smooth that yarn um, and smooth down any scales that may be there. Um, and that coating is almost like, or it is, nylon based. So a lot of us still use a superwash merino nylon blend for our socks, but technically you don't even have to if it's not going to be a hard wearing sock because there's a coating already on the yarn that um, is like nylon. So don't take my word for that. I can't remember where I heard that. Um, might have been from Anna on Dunkle Groon, but I'm not sure. So. Um, I, I by no means am telling you to ditch the nylon in your sock yarn, but um, it is definitely a sturdier yarn. However, 
there are... So, okay. I talked about the drawback of Superwash being not necessarily eco-friendly, although there are things coming out. The other thing that Superwash is not good for is color work. Um, because the way you, well, especially stranded color work, the way that you do that with the strands, the wool doesn't hold on to each other. So you're much more likely to get gapping uh, and, and see the yarns behind. Also, Superwash wool doesn't bounce back to its original shape. Um, regular wool is extensible, which means it can stretch out when it's wet, and then when it dries, it will go back to shape. It almost like it has a memory of the shape it was in. Superwash wool, and that's because of the scales. Superwash wool doesn't have the scales anymore, so it doesn't do that. And it can just give your color work a really messy look. Um, you know, when all po whenever possible, you should use a non-superwash wool for your color work. Um, some of the organic um, superwash wools are not quite as stripped of their scales as the Hercocet method, and so some of them do have a little bit of scales, which means they still could felt and they still could grab a little. So you might be able to get away with those, um, but typically I would stay away from superwash in um, color work. And the other thing that Superwash is not good for is steaking. And for the same reasons, you know, when you, you can get away with it, and a lot of people do it all the time, but it's not the greatest choice. So when you steak something, you're cutting your yarn. And yes, you're reinforcing it on the sides, either through crochet or sewing, and then you cut it, but it's much more likely to be more durable and stand the test of time if it's not a Superwash wool. Um, like I said, that's not a hard and fast rule. I have certainly broken that rule many times, and um, I will in the future. I'm going to cast on a Sunset Highway soon, and I've picked out Superwash wool for that. And I just did the uh, Underwing Mitts by Erica Hauser, and those are in a Superwash wool. Um, and so, yes, you can break the rules, but you know, if you're looking to do something heirloom quality, it's going to last a long time, it's going to have color work, or it's going to be steeped, or whatever. Um, stick with a real wool because you're going to be really happy with the results there. So that's pretty much the scoop on wool. Oh, I'm going to show you a super wash. So I showed you the woolen and worsted spun 100% wools. And I will show you a super wash. So here's a caked up hank of superwash. And you can see it has a matte kind of, well, maybe a little pearlescent finish to it. And it is very, very smooth looking. And then this is our woolen spun. Let's see if I can do this. I'll use a pencil. Nope, this is worse, it's fun, sorry. So you can see the difference between them. Um, this has been hanging out in a bin, so it is a little fuzzy. Um, but especially when you see them next to each other. This is clearly a much smoother yarn, and this is a merino nylon, whereas this is 100% woolen spun uh, blend of 100% wool. So that's the difference there. And this is crazy soft. Like I could have this right here up against my sensitive neck skin, and there's no itch at all. And um, I, you know, make sweaters with this. If it's a sweater that I'm going to have right against my skin, I will go for a superwash merino. But if it's going to be a bigger sweater that I'm going to, you know, layer with things, then I like to try and do something a little bit more rustic. So, not necessarily rustic, but not super wash. I do like merino a lot, so, and cashmere, but 
Next time, we are going to talk about goats. So we're gonna talk cashmere goats, for that oh so coveted cashmere. And we're gonna talk about angora goats, which is what gives us mohair. Not to be confused with angora bunnies. They are not the same thing. I didn't know that. Maybe you didn't know that. Now you'll know that. So um, that is all I have to talk about for wool today. I hope that this was really helpful for you and it will help you make uh, good choices for your yarn and your projects. And I will have a thread on Ravelry for questions about fiber. So if you have any questions uh, or if there's anything you want me to talk about, post there and we'll see you next time. Thanks.